So welcome back guys, this is Dr. Ajinka here and as you must have seen, uh, today's topic is going to be about the bony landmarks. Now what the term bony landmark means for me in this video is that uh, if you are a skull based surgeon or a neurosurgeon and the neurosurgeon who operates through endonasal endoscopic transspinoidal route, uh, we need to know the various bony landmarks for various neurovascular structures to prevent injury and to have a successful outcome in a surgery. Now what you can see on the screen right here is the 3D model of a sphenoid bone. Now why sphenoid bone is because uh, the sphenoid sinus uh, is the most important sinus of all for a skull base and a neurosurgeon because it acts as a crossroad or you can say the uh, the area. A lot of various uh, neurovascular structures lie in relation to the uh, close relation to the sphenoid sinus. Uh, so I'll be I'll be discussing about the various uh, important neurovascular structures and bony landmarks which can help identify various uh, important structures to have a successful surgery without any complications. Uh, so for that, I'll be doing a 3D anatomy study. Also, I'll be showing you a lot of uh, bony models, uh, photographs. Uh, also, I'll be showing you a lot of cadaveric photographs as in what structures you can actually encounter and what is the anatomy and what are the simple uh, structures you can encounter while operating uh, for a skull based surgery to enter into a middle cranial fossa because the sphenoid sinus uh, on either side there's cavernous sinus uh, they are all structures of the middle cranial fossa so to access the middle cranial fossa we need to know a lot of anatomy uh, for a skull based surgeon endoscopically also i'll be discussing about this photograph as well this is a cadaveric photograph of the patient's right side where you can actually see the cavernous sinus and the uh, intracavernous uh, carotid the uh, paraclenoidal carotid and the pituitary gland so the relationship of the viridian nerve and the internal carotid artery how the bony landmark of the viridian canal can be really helpful for identifying the ICA part that I'll be talking about in detail so the first thing was the bony anatomy the various uh, labelings and the anatomy of the bone landmarks second I'll be talking about the viridian canal anatomy uh, in relation to the internal carotid artery the third thing I'll be talking about the entire sphenoid sinus bony landmarks. So if you open up a sphenoid sinus, what bony projections, prominences, important neurovascular structures you can see over here on either side of the sphenoid sinus, I will be talking in detail. So much brief detail I'll be talking about so that whenever you, uh, even a normal uh, ENT fest surgeon can operate on a patient uh, and open up the sinus in the sphenoid area and can know about the various structures so this is a really important topic which a lot of junior colleagues miss out on because they don't get a chance to operate in their own parent uh, training institutes so i hope this video is really helpful so um, this is the same cadaveric photograph i'll be talking about about the anatomy as well so this is this also also one more point i'll be talking about the radiological aspect of the uh, bony anatomy of the uh, various sphenoid sinus area so as you can see over here this is the uh, this is the particular area of the sphenoid sinus and the various uh, anatomical parts of the sphenoid and how the neurovascular structures are in relation to each other in this particular area and what you can do to find them on the steady scan i'll be talking about that as well so three main points is the first the bony landmarks second is the cadaveric photographs of the relations of the bony landmarks and the third is the uh, radiological aspect so i think i'll be covering a lot of points in this video so the first point will be the uh, bony landmarks uh, so i'll just give you a rough gist of the uh, the landmarks which you can see over on the sphenoid bone so this is the front view of the sphenoid bone uh, if you're a skull based surgeon doing an endoscopic surgery this is a sphenoid ostia so uh, as soon as you widen up the sphenoid ostia over here you will start entering the sphenoid sinus proper inside so this is a sphenoid ostia this is the right sphenoid that's the left sphenoid that's the anterior wall of the sphenoid sinus uh, so this is the this is the lesser ring that's the lesser ring of sphenoid. If viewed from backside, you can see it like this. This is the lesser ring of sphenoid. Um, that's the greater ring of sphenoid as well. So 
lesser and the greater wing of sphenoid there's a potential space in between as i spoke in my last lectures uh, that's the superior orbital fissure the major major structure uh, which connects the uh, middle cranial fossa to the orbit is the superior orbital fissure so that's the superior orbital fissure really important that's the optic canal over here that's the medial and the lateral pterygoid plate so that's a part of the sphenoid bone itself so if you turn it backside, you can see that's a foramen over here and which is directly inferior lateral to the superior orbital fissure. So that's the foramen rotundum, which transmits the we know the famous maxillary nerve, the second division of the trigeminal nerve. That's the uh, foramen rotundum, which you can see on the uh, greater wing of sphenoid from the posterior as well as the anterior aspect over here. So remember that the very important thing to remember is that it's always below the superior or vital fissure so when you're kind of operating on the patient and if you get a structure like this somehow in your surgery you can see this is a second curve the second part of the trigeminal nerve that's the maxillary nerve which comes out from the uh, the, the so-called foramen rotundum so here somewhere above is the superior orbital fissure anteriorly and there will be the foramen rotundum somewhere here so this is why you should know where exactly which uh, bony landmark lies so so this is roughly uh, as you can see this is a planum spinoidal uh, as i showed you that this is the spinoid sinus over here so the roof of the spinoid sinus is nothing but the uh, planum so this is the planum over here and uh, the lesser wing which projects posterior medially has this pointing substance you can see that this is a pointing thing over here uh, so whatever this is thing is which is pointing in nature and that is directed posterior medially that is called as the anterior clinoid process uh, i have discussed this already in my previous lecture so this is the anterior clinoid process uh, this is a cellar torsica that's the floor uh, in which the uh the pituitary gland is actually lodged that's the uh, middle cranial the middle clinoid process and that's the posterior clinoid process so we have three clinoid processes we have this one is the anterior one in the lesser wing then at the anterior face of the cella torsica we have the middle uh, clinoid process over here and that's the uh, the posterior clinoid process over here and that's the clivus of the spinoid bone so this is a basic anatomy of the spinoid bone now i'm gonna do a separate whole detailed lecture on the spinoid bone its muscle attachments its various anatomical parts and neurovascular uh, relation and uh, also the relation with the uh, the petrus apex i'm going to show in a separate video for exam going students so for now you remember the basics of the anatomy so that's the basic anatomy of the spinoid bone so far and uh, the bony foramen rotundum so i think this is a bony landmark so for to further understand having a different photograph over here somewhere yeah so if this this is a superior view of the anterior and the middle cranial fossa from above so this is the optic canal as i showed you some time back that's the anterior clinoid process that's the foramen rotundum that's the foramen oval that's the uh, foramen spinosum over here and that's the foramen lacerum so i've also showed you all the foramens uh, in the skull base in my previous lectures so this is something you need to remember for a really long time so the first thing i'm going to talk about is the uh, when you open up a spinoid sinus now if a skull based surgeon or a neurosurgeon enters into the spinoid sinus the first thing he is going to see uh, oh wait a second i'll talk about before entering the spinoid sinus so if you enter uh, bef so before entering into the spinoid sinus what you have to do is that you have to localize the coina now what you can see over here is the patient's uh, right coina and that's the left coina so in the coina you're going to observe three real important structures which is the uh, is taken to over here so the very first or you can see the very anterior most structure or the opening you can see over here uh, on the lateral aspect is the is taken tube opening and you will be You'll be, you'll be able to see a large bulbous structure protruding on the uh, posterior aspect of the istrican tube that will be the torus tuberus that torus tuberus is nothing but a bulge of the cartilaginous portion of the uh, the istrican tube so the istrican tube has two parts we all know that bony part and the cartilaginous part the cartilaginous part starts over here and that 
area which you can see in the torus tuberus nothing but the representation of the bulge of the cartilaginous part of the ischiacin tube now right exactly posterior to that and superior to that we have a fossa called as the fossa of rosenmuller now this fossa of rosenmuller carries a huge clinical significance because of its uh, relation to the internal carotid artery the parapharyngeal internal carotid artery so very much posterior lateral to this fossa of rosenmuller we're going to have the internal carotid artery so whenever a skull based surgeon has to operate on a carotid artery lesion in the case of parapharyngeal space uh, we have to access from this area the fossa of rosenmuller so in that case we also can have to do a nasopharyngectomy so we need to know the anatomy of this area so these three structures are really important for beginners so right from the anterior to the posterior we have the ischiacin tube the torus tuberus and the uh, fossa of rosenmuller so that's going to be same on the other side as well now if we go above we know that the spinoid sinus uh, is of two one on each side so that's having an interspinoidal septum and that anteriorly uh, is thickened by the uh, rostrum of spinoid as you can see over here the thickened part on the anterior face of the spinoid in the midline is the uh, the spinoid rostrum the spinoid rostrum which is actually attached to the vomer of the nasal septum as well as the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid mostly to the vomer bone now vomer we all know that's the uh, inferior posterior inferior part of the uh, nasal septum and the posterior superior part is the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid so we need to understand and when we open up the spinoid sinus over here we need to break open the attachment of the vomer and the uh, the rostrum so that we can expose the rostrum and we can remove the rostrum as well by the help of the uh, the carison's bone punch and we can have a common entrance into the spinoid sinus and make it a huge opening so this is this is for the big neural level uh, once we proceed with the surgery, we open up the spinoid sinus and the first thing we see in the spinoid sinus before we see something like this is that it is this. So once you make a huge common opening in the spinoid sinus, you can see a lot of bony and uh, bony projections over here with a lot of neurovascular uh, structures popping out so this is the midline as you can see over here and that's the patient's right side that's the patient's left side. Uh, so this is all this is remember that this is the uh, endonasal view uh, because nowadays a lot of neurosurgeons are kind of helping out with the skull based surgeons to uh, gain approach to the middle cranial fossa and the anterior cranial fossa through endonasal roots so that's a huge advance in the uh, skull based surgery for skull based surgeons and the neurosurgeons so mind me that this is the endonasal transspinoidal view um, so this is a patient's right side and that's the left side. So the first thing we see is the clivus. Now the clivus is nothing but this is a clival recess which is in the central midline up to the floor of the spinoid sinus. So what we see over here is the clival recess. Exactly above the clival recess in the midline we're going to have the cella. That's the pituitary gland. As we all know that's the cella in the midline. And the, on either side of the cella we're going to have the cavernous sinus the right one and the left one also on uh, above as well as below and on the posterior aspect we're going to have the intercavernous sinus the superior the inferior intercavernous sinus so whatever you see blue over here is the area of uh, four blues as i discussed in my previous lectures so this is the cavernous sinus ev everywhere and above uh, the cavernous sinus in the midline you're going to have the roof of the spinoid that's the planum spinoidale so that's the planum that's the roof of the spinoid now the most important neurovascular structure which you can see over here on either side on the superior lateral aspect is the uh, carotid artery now the, the, this is the carotid artery the paraclival part the, the paracellar part and this is the optic nerve so it is very 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 evident if the spinoid sinus has a good pneumatization so this you can see a horizontal structure running like horizontally the whitish bulge is nothing but the optic nerve and the huge bulge over here is the carotid artery so at the junction of the optic nerve and the carotid artery bulge we're gonna have in between this two the uh, lateral OCR 
and the medial OCR. Okay, so this OCR concept is like really important. Now I've done a surgery and I've posted a surgery of a normal fest surgery where I have opened up the entire sphenoid sinus and I've tried to expose the optic nerve, uh, the carotid artery. The uh, In that video, the lateral OCR is quite prominent because the pneumatization of the sphenoid sinus is very much clear in that patient. So I'll post the link of that surgical video. You can go and check it out. So this is a lateral OCR. Um, if I show you the next uh, photograph, this is going to be real clear. That's the midline cellar floor. So that's the pituitary gland you can see over here. Uh, and that's the clinical, uh, that's the para, that, that's the uh, intracavernous carotid artery over here. That's the optic nerve you can see over here. So without the labeling also, you should be able to identify the structure. So whatever horizontal white structure you can see over here is the optic nerve coming horizontally in the center to form the optic chiasm over here. So always remember in the midline, we're going to have the pituitary gland exactly above the pituitary gland we're going to have the superior intercavernous sinus and exactly above the superior intercavernous sinus we're going to have the tubercular bone uh, we are we call this bone as the tubercular bone hence if we remove this bone and enter the middle cranial fossa we call that as the trans tubercular approach so this is a tubercular bone always remember that and exactly above the tubercular bone we have the planum that's the roof of sphenoid so uh, we're going to have the midline pituitary, then the superior intercavernous sinus, the tubercular bone, and the planum. So always remember, uh, this, this is the area of the tubercular bone. So if I can show you on this photograph as well, uh, this is going to be much clearer for you. So if I try to zoom this, uh, you can actually see that's the pituitary gland in the center, in the midline. Um, that's the superior intercavernous sinus. And as the, as the labeling suggests, that's the tubercular cellar bone. So that's the tubercular bone over here, exactly above the superior intercavernous sinus. And on the uh, lateral aspect, you're going to see the carotid artery, as you can see on the screen right now. And that's the optic nerve. So exactly behind the tubercular bone, if you remove the tubercular bone, you're going to see the optic chiasm covered under the dura matter so you, if, you, if you remove the dura uh, you can see the optic nerve uh, the optic chiasm which i have shown actually in my previous lecture of transtubercular surgery so you can go and check it out so you can see the optic chiasm behind that so that's a tubercular bone now to understand the concept of the lateral ocr and the medial ocr first you should know what exactly is an ocr and what structure forms the ocr so basically the ocr is nothing but the optico carotid recess that's the junction of the carotid artery with the optic nerve so there's this uh, pneumatization of the bone called as the uh, optic strut now the optic strut is a bone okay it's a bony ridge it's actually a bone a part of the anterior clinoid process that's the acp anterior clinoid process so optic strut is a part of it so if the optic strut goes under a lot of pneumatization, that forms the lateral OCR. So the lateral OCR actually demarcates the area of the carotid artery uniting with the, or you can say that it's almost a junction with the optic nerve above. So that's actually the area of the lateral OCR. It forms a depression. Almost always all patients, all patients have a visible lateral OCR. So that's the concept of the OCR over here. That's the pneumatization of the optic strut. The optic strut being the uh, floor of the optic canal and the roof of the superior orbital fissure and being a part of the anterior clinoid process. So uh, moving on to the medial OCR. Now the medial OCR is actually representing the area of the carotid artery over here, leaving the dural ring and junction up of it with the optic uh, nerve above. So that's the area of the medial OCR. Now always remember to make it easy for you. The medial OCR is actually very much medial in its concept. So as you can see, the lateral OCR is very much placed laterally at the junction, uh, lateral to the junction of the optic nerve and the carotid artery. But the medial OCR is almost near the midline and uh, 
uh, it is actually more medial as compared to the allosteria. So as you can see, so if you're trying to operate on a patient and you see this structure, uh, the medial OCR may not be present in all patients because it is really difficult to observe for a medial OCR. The lateral OCR though is very much visible, but the medial OCR is hardly seen in a patient only uh, if the patient's penoid sinus is really well limitized. Um, then only you can see the medial OCR very well. So uh, medial o the other way to locate the medial OCR is that you first locate the tubercular bone and the most lateral aspect of the tubercular bone, the area just above that will be the medial OCR. So that's the other way of locating the medial OCR. Now, there are two more important terms uh, which I guess a lot of people do not know about is the lateral tubercular recess that's called as the LTR and the DOA which is called as the distal osseous arch. So this is the uh, distal osseous arch as you can see over here that's the DOA. So that's the DOA, that's the distal osseous arch. So the LTR and the DOA are two new terms that I should uh, talk about so that all the new uh, neurosurgeons and the skull based surgeons are well aware of it. So what does the LTR stand for? The LTR is the lateral tubercular recess. Now the recess is a gap or depression just like we saw the um, the clival recess over here we have the lateral tubercular recess now we saw this tubercular bone over here just above the superior intercavenous sinus so that's on the very lateral aspect of the actually on the lateral end of the tubercular bone there's a depression uh, called as the lateral tubercular recess so it's kind of very easy to identify but not well pneumatized if not well pneumatized it is very difficult to see and locate that thing so it is at the very lateral end of the tubercular bone that's the lateral tubercular recess and the uh the distal osseous arch is something a bony ridge you can see this is a bony ridge which is present between the uh the the lateral tubercular recess and the LOCR. So as you can see, this is the LOCR over here, which is very much laterally placed. And this is the lateral end of the actual tubercular bone. So the bony ridge between this LOCR and this LTR is nothing but the osseous ridge called as the distal osseous arch. That is the DOA. So these are the new two terms which I came across uh, in my studies so I would like to share with you guys that's the lateral tubercular recess and the distal osseous arch. Now uh, we all know about the uh, the optic strut now we all know about the optic strut but um, there's one more strut that we need to understand and that's the uh, maxillary strut okay that's the maxillary strut we need to understand now if i can show you this photograph over here now this is the back side the back view the exact view now just look at the image over here and um, look at the image over here that's the same image right that's the back view so that's the same image i'm trying to show you that's the foramen rotundum over here for the maxillary nerve that's the superior orbital fissure and that's the anterior clinoid process and that's the area of the optic strut that's the area of the optic strut that's the optic canal so basically the optic strut acts as the floor of the optic canal and the roof of the superior orbital fissure and the second thing which you can see over here is the maxillary strut now the maxillary strut is the ridge of bone that separates the superior orbital fissure above and the foramen rotundum below so the bone which separates the cranial nerves which you can see in the sof with the cranial nerve which is in the v2 is the maxillary strut now it's very very important for a skull base and a neurosurgeon to know about this because if there's a lesion in the superior orbital fissure and you need to remove that lesion and you kind of want to know the relationship of that lesion with the v2 that's the maxillary nerve from the foramen you need to know that there's a bone in between these two structures that separates them very well and that's the maxillary strut so maxillary strut is nothing but the uh, a trapezoid shaped as you can see this is the maxillary strut over here uh, this is a back view so if you 
uh, locate this from the back view it is called as the maxillary strut but if you view that if i if i show you this on the same 3d model over here that's the superior orbital fissure and that's the foramen rotundum so this over here is the uh, anterior clinoid process uh, so the roof of the optic canal right so the, the the floor sorry the floor of the optic canal and the roof of the uh, the superior orbital fissure over here so this structure exactly was the optic strut over here that's the optic strut which i can show you on the 3d model as well so whatever you can see over here this is the optic strut over here and that optic optic strut pneumatization is called as the uh, the locr okay this is this you need to understand very clearly so the maxillary strut is the area of the bone which you can see over here that's the maxillary strut which separates the sof with the foramen rotundum so the maxillary strut is of real clinical importance so if the same maxillary strut is viewed from the anterior aspect you can see this is a superior orbital fissure and that's the foramen rotundum so we call that maxillary strut now as the maxillary recess if viewed from the anterior aspect so this is a maxillary recess uh, so if we remove the maxillary recess it allows for the access to the middle cranial fossa during the endoscopic endonasal approach so if i remove this from the anterior aspect i'm directly into the middle cranial fossa this is how you enter into the middle cranial fossa through endoscopic approaches so i spoke about the optic strut the locr mocr the maxillary strut maxillary recess um, i need to talk about the vidian canal and the relationship of the vidian nerve as a bony landmark to the location of the ica so if i try to show you the photograph over here the dissection photograph uh, okay, so if you open up the entire uh, lateral wall of the sphenoid sinus, you're going to see the cavernous sinus over here and uh, you can see the entire structure or the pathway of the paraclival and the paracellar part of the internal carotid artery. So as you can see over here, now we all know that the floor of the cavernous sinus is the V2. The V2 acts as the floor of the cavernous sinus and above that we're going to have all the other cranial nerves in the lateral wall from above below. So exactly below the optic strut bone, the optic strut bone will be lying here somewhere around because this is the optic nerve coming like this. That's the ICA part over here. So the, op the clinoid process will be here somewhere. So this will be the optic strut over here. So exactly below the optic strut, uh, we will have the third cranial nerve. Then below that, we'll have the fourth trochlear nerve. And then we're going to have the V1. And then we're going to have the V2 over here, as you can see in the photograph. And in the medial aspect, as compared to the lateral wall, we're going to have the abducent nerve over here. And medial to the abducent nerve, we're going to have the internal carotid artery. So this is the entire cavernous sinus. You can see the inferior lateral trunk over here. Uh, I spoke about the inferior lateral trunk as well, as well as the meningohypophyseal trunk as well in my previous lectures. So this is a V2 you can see over here. That's the foramen rotundum you can see over here. And this, all these neurovascular structures, that is the third cranial nerve, the fourth cranial nerve, the, this V1 and V2, they all enter into the cavernous sinus, from the cavernous sinus into the superior orbital fissure. So anterior to this is the superior orbital fissure. And, and the floor, we can see the Vidian canal over here, the pterygopyethan fossa, the Vidian canal, the Vidian nerve, and the relationship of the Vidian nerve to the uh, foramen lacerum, which is right here, and the ICA, which is right here. So, um, so if a scalpy surgeon is trying to operate on a patient with Vidian nerve uh, lesion, he wants to locate the Vidian nerve, or if there's a tumor uh, in the pterygopyethan fossa extending a, a uh, it's having a huge extension uh, so that in that case where the, the, uh, the surgeon cannot locate the ICA uh, he can use the, the location of the Vidian nerve what he can do is that uh, as you can see we uh, we have a labeling over here the nine o'clock labeling and the six o'clock labeling over here okay just let me zoom this that you can see over here you can see the the numerical line and the numerical six over here so First, we need to drill the Vidian canal. Now, the Vidian canal is present uh, just above the uh, medial pterygoid plate. 
as you can see over here, that's the pterygoid plate over here. That's the medial one, that's the lateral one. So just above and lateral to the medial pterygoid plate, we're gonna have the Vidian canal. So uh, for that, you have to first open up the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus. You have to locate the various structures of the uh, pterygopath and fossa. Uh, and once you locate the Vidian nerve, uh, that's the Vidian canal, you gotta start drilling the Vidian canal uh, from its uh, inferior medial side that's the medial side first and then the superior side so that we can lift the nerve superiorly and the last structure to be drilled is the inferior lateral so the inferior lateral structure is drilled last and we can lift the vidian nerve above and we can actually trace the vidian nerve posteriorly and uh, we can locate for the internal carotid artery because the vidian nerve in short the vidian canal is consistently anterior superior and medial to the anterior genu of the petrous part of the temporal bone. I'll repeat that once again. The Vidian canal or you can say the Vidian nerve is actually anterior, superior and medial to the anterior genu of the petrous part. Now this is the paraclival part. Somewhere like this, the, uh, the first vertical segment of the petrous part will come, then the horizontal segment will come, and then again a short vertical segment. So that's the posterior genu over here, which is posterior, the artery keeps on coming anterior. That's the horizontal segment, and that's the anterior genu here actually. So as we have a posterior genu over here, the anterior genu over somewhere here. So we have the Vidian canal, which is anterior, superior, and medial to the anterior genu of the petrous part of the ICA. So this is how you're gonna remember the relationship of the Vidian nerve to the ICA. And um, we can use the Vidian nerve bony landmark uh, to locate for the ICA. So this, these are the very few important bony landmarks that you need to be aware of as a skull base and a neurosurgeon. Um, so I, I, can, I think I've covered up all the bony landmarks uh, on, the, on the cadaver photographs and the relationship of the Vidian canal and the ICA as well and what structures you see once you open up the uh, spinoid sinus basically. So I think I can show you now the radiological aspect of the, uh, the bony landmarks. So if we try to open up the... Uh, the CD scan. Now you can ask for any CD scan, but make sure that you have a 0.5 to 0.6 or max to max of 1 mm thickness CD scan coronal view. Uh, what you can see over here is, wait, wait a second, so I'm going from the anterior to the posterior aspect. Uh, this is the anterior clinoid process I spoke about some time back. That's the anterior clinoid process. That's the optic nerve that's the optic nerve impression that's the internal carotid artery impression so this basically area this area is the area of the cavernous sinus which you can see on the CT scan the gold standard choice for study of cavernous sinus is the MRI scan uh, so this is a CT scan so you can see the cavernous sinus which is right here and um, that's the body of the spinoid the anterior clinoid process is basically a part of the lesser wing of spinoid so as you can see if I'm coming anterior, this is the lesser wing of spinoid. And as we go posterior, this lesser wing of spinoid will give off the uh, anterior clinoid process over here. And um, this is a right spinoid, that's the left spinoid. Uh, and this is the vomer, sorry, not the vomer, but that's the rostrum of spinoid. The thickened part is called as the rostrum. And uh, that's the inferior orbital fissure. And uh, so as I was saying that this is the uh, cavernous sinus over here. The cavernous sinus anteriorly is nothing but the superior orbital fissure. So the cavernous sinus anteriorly continues as the superior orbital fissure. So this is the most posterior aspect. As you can see, this is the most posterior aspect of the spinoid. So this is the cavernous sinus. So if I'm coming anteriorly, this cavernous sinus will eventually become the superior orbital fissure somewhere around here. And this is the inferior orbital fissure. So this is a superior orbital fissure at the area of the orbital apex over here. And this is the inferior orbital fissure, which you can clearly see over here. And this is the area of the spinopalatine foramen over here. So this is how you kind of locate the areas of the bony foramen and the bony fissures uh, on the CT scan. So uh, let, me, let me show you the optic strut if I can show you. Yep, 
this structure which you can see over here is the area of the optic strut which is very much clearly visible now this is the area of the optic nerve uh, yeah, this is the area of the optic nerve. That's the area of the ICA. So the junction towards them. Now, this is the actual part of the optic strut. You can see a thin area over here. That's the bony part of the ACP. That's the optic strut. So if this optic strut gets pneumatized a lot, that can be seen on the superior lateral wall of the sphenoid sinus over there. And we have this medial pterygoid plate, the lateral pterygoid plate. We have this pterygoid wedge. And we can see the two openings over here. This is a viridian canal. So as I spoke about some time back, that this is the internal carotid artery. Now let me see if I can show you the petrous part of the carotid artery over here. If I can, if I, if only I can show you on this coronal section. I need a head and neck. I need a neck CT scan for that. But I'll try to show you the. Uh, the carotid artery and the petrous part over here. You can see this is inferior orbital fissure. So I have to locate the ICA first properly. This is the area of the ICA at the orbital apex actually. So it's kind of hard to locate the petrous part of the uh, ICA in this scan, but I'll show you in the next scan if possible. So this is the area of the paracellar and the paraclinoid carotid artery. So we know that the Virian canal as I said sometime back, the Virian canal is anterior, superior, and medial to the petrous part. So the petrous part will be somewhere, it, it will come like this. The cervical part will come like this over here. Then take a turn, which is called the posterior genu. Then come medially and superiorly and anteriorly. And have a horizontal segment somewhere here. Then we'll go up again here near the foramen lacerum and then become the paraclival with the this is a this is a coina that's the spinoid so this area will be the paraclival area somewhere around here so the virian canal is a good locator for the ica and the virian canal is always inferior medial as you can see this is a medial pterygoid plate and i told you that the virian canal will be superior and a bit lateral or you can say sometimes superior only to the medial pterygoid plate so if you want to locate the virian nerve Always remember that it is very much superior exactly to the medial pterygoid plate in that same level. And superior lateral to that will be the uh, foramen rotundum. You can see the very much clear foramen rotundum right here. This one will transmit the uh, V2. Now, as I spoke sometime back, that the area of the bone that separates the foramen rotundum below and the superior orbital fissure above. So let me come anteriorly over here. This is a foramen rotundum you can see over here. That's the area of the uh, superior orbital fissure, which eventually enters the orbit. As you can see, this is the orbit. Uh, this is the orbital apex. Uh, the same area will be the superior orbital fissure over here. And that's the foramen rotundum. So the part of bone which you can see over here is called as the maxillary strut. This area is the maxillary strut over here. So this is very important for the surgeon to know. Uh, so I think this is pretty much uh, cleared up on the uh, CT scan, I guess. So uh, I hope uh, I'm, I hope this video is really helpful for you guys to know the bony, various different bony landmarks uh, of the spinoid sinus and structures surrounding it. So in my next lecture, I'll be talking in detail about the Virian canal and the Virian nerve pathway, its formation in the foramen lacerum and how the Virian canal and the Virian nerve traverses in relation to the internal carotid artery. And in my further next video, I'll be talking about the spinoid sinus and the spinoid bone in whole, uh, how the various parts of spinoid sinus and the spinoid bone come together, the basic anatomy of spinoid bone in short. So I hope you liked the video. Uh, till then, take care guys.